You know, it's kind of hard to believe that since its debut 26 years ago, Sid Meier's Civilization series has been the name in the 4X subgenre of strategy gaming. However, in 26 years, Civilization has changed a lot since its inaugural entry. Hi, I'm Darren P. Mack with the Leaderboard. Join me as we discover together some of the ways this monolithic game series has changed since 1991. Let's get started. <laughs> Civilization 1. Having mostly worked on flight simulator games beforehand, developer Sid Meier decided to break new ground in 1990 when he started developing a strategy game based on human history. He was a contractor at the time for a company called Micro Pros, with his most notable contribution being the highly successful Railroad Tycoon. Trying to spin the building and farming idea into something grander, Sid Meier disappeared into the deep woods, coding until 1991, when strategy gaming was changed forever as Civilization burst onto the MS-DOS. The initial game was only 3.5 megabytes in size, but it packed a hefty punch. Even in its first incarnation, it featured 15 different civilizations to play as, each with their own distinct style of play and perks. The top-down gameplay was reminiscent of SimCity, but on a much larger scale. Land masses were randomized, but slightly customizable, allowing the player to select the size, temperature, climate, and age of the world that they were about to explore and conquer. There were two ways to win the original civilization. You would either conquer the entire world in a military victory, or through diplomacy and science become the first to build a spaceship and launch it towards the distant planet Alpha Centauri. Now, some aspects of the game, including the setting and branching technology paths, may or may not have been borrowed from an unrelated and already existing board game named Civilization. Designed in 1982 for the Avalon Hill Company by Francis Tresham, this is cited a lot as a direct inspiration, and it's not hard to see why. Sid Meier kind of goes back and forth on if and how much the game inspired what would become his trademark video game series. It has been mentioned that this graphics and Civilization 1 are very board game-esque. The top-down perspective makes the whole thing look and play a little bit like a game of Risk, but hey, that just might be 1991 graphics taking the wheel. Regardless, Civilization 1 was a massive hit. It was eventually ported to nine different platforms, including its final incarnation on everyone's favorite, the Nokia Engage. This is also as good a time as ever to discuss Mahatma Gandhi, beloved historical figure and dropper of nukes. So you might know by now, but why does Gandhi drop so many nuclear weapons in the Civ games? It's actually because of a bug in the cold. Turns out that in Civilization 1, with Civilization's adopted democracy, the unseen aggression score of the computer's AI was reduced by two. Gandhi's default aggression score for the AI was set at the lowest possible grade, one. When the computer subtracted two from it, programming went all Y2K on us. Instead of making Gandhi basically the most passive dude in the universe with an aggression of negative two, it looped around to setting his aggression to 255. This was hilarious, of course, when contrasted with the well-known historical figure of Gandhi. And this was strangely incorporated into some of The Sims games down the road, with India being passive in the early game and then getting ludicrously aggressive in the late stages of the game. So if you take anything away from this video, let it be that it's a bad idea to push Gandhi in any Civ game. Uh, his words are back with nuclear weapons. Civilization 2. Microprose knew they had a hit on their hands and immediately launched into developing a sequel appropriately titled Civilization 2. Sid Meier was strangely not involved in this entry, eventually winning a legal battle which would get all future Civ games under his personal control and award the publishing rights to his newly formed company, Firaxis. Okay, so the legal stuff comes a little bit down the road, but we're not there yet. Let's just stick with Civ 2. So what changed in this entry? Well, quite a bit actually. The core gameplay remains the same, but any Civilization Neo fights will see that things are starting to look more familiar. Top-down view is gone, replaced by an isometric third-person perspective, more akin to StarCraft. There are now 21 playable civilizations, with 7 on the board at any given time. Computer-controlled civilizations eliminated early on can actually return later as another sieve of the same color set? It's kind of odd to be honest. The color sets seem kind of arbitrary, like the Indians and the Sioux are grouped together. I don't get it either, but 1996, I guess. Other, bit more logical changes included an improved combat system with reworked hit points 
and the ability to automate non-combat units such as workers and settlers. Civilization 2 also allowed players to choose whether their ruler would be male or female, and had culturally appropriate choices for either depending on their civilization. For some reason, this disappeared in future entries and, and color me disappointed. I want to lead America with Eleanor Roosevelt, I want to lead the Sioux with Sacagawea, which is weird because she's Shoshone, but uh, you know, whatever, inclusivity. Beyond all of this, Civ 2 was most notable for having the High Council. These were advisors to the player who were portrayed with great enthusiasm by community theater live actors in different costumes. Honestly, it's worth the YouTube search to see them in all of their original glory. Civilization was released for PC in 1996 and was ported to the Sony PlayStation two years later. But this series was, was far from done because one costly lawsuit and one new company later, we meet Civilization 3. And, and that's Sid Meier's Civilization 3 to you. Well, sort of. Meyer's name was added above the series for this entry onwards, even though the actual development fell to someone else. Released for the Windows and Mac OS in 2001, Civ 3 is where the series really starts stepping towards what we know and love today. First and foremost, there were more ways to win. As opposed to the first two games where there were only two types of victories, Civilization 3 offers six. The conquest and spaceship victories return, but are joined by domination, owning 66% of all land and population, cultural victory, diplomatic victory, that means building the wonder of the United Nations and being elected chancellor, and histography, which is a hidden score that is tallied up if time runs out in 2050 AD and no other victory had been achieved. Resources became another huge thing for Civ 3. Now, resources are tied to different blocks on the map and are hugely important. Some are strategic for building weaponry, some are luxurious for culture and happiness, and some are bonus resources, which add a nice stat boost to that square and encourage building a city nearby. Other changes including adding ethnicity to your citizens, which incorporated cultural heritage and memory, and could affect their overall happiness. Basically, if you capture the city of a different ethnicity, it took several turns for the new citizens to become acclimated to your new culture. The time depended on how strong the culture and government of that civilization happened to be at the time you captured them. These citizens could also become enraged if you attack the culture of their birth, which gives newly captured cities a high chance of rebelling against you. Dark, and gone by the next game, so, so don't think too much about it. Speaking of, Corruption also became a big thing for cities too far from the capital. Corruption existed in the previous two games, but it was reworked in three to become much harder to combat, especially for larger civs. Too much corruption would lead to cities no longer functioning, essentially being a weight that dragged your entire civilization down. The number of civs in the base game was chopped down to 16 but each was awarded a special unit that could only be built by that player. That's right, we got Samurai now. Add in more streamlined combat and the explosion of the modern community, and Civ 3 was an even bigger hit than its predecessors. It's still pretty consistently named one of the best strategy games of all time, and is considered a bit of a high water mark for an already pretty lauded franchise. Time marches on, however, and so do Civilization sequels, which leads us to Civilization 4. If it ain't broke, really smooth it out in iteration. You know, that's what I say. Civilization 4 was more of a hop forward than a full jump for the series, but it still broke new ground in many regards, not the least of which was the introduction of religion. Now players could found one of seven distinct religions and spread them to other civilizations on the map, which added in a number of ways. Civs with the same religion had closer diplomatic relations. For starters, having a state religion, a religion's holy city, and a religion's sacred building also offered the players line of sight to every city converged to that religion, a huge tactical advantage. Religions also offered great economic bonuses and could lead to an early diplomatic victory by building the wonder, the Apostolistic Palace. If erected, the palace functioned much the same way as the UN did later in the game. Speaking of the UN, its functions changed a bit in 4. Now, global resolutions can be passed with the UN to bolster the player and hamper enemy civilization, including trade embargoes and non-nuclear proliferation treaties. Diplomacy in general was streamlined and made more clear. Non-player leaders were given an attitude marker. They were either gracious, friendly, annoyed, ferocious, etc. And the player was explicitly told why the leader felt this way toward a specific civilization. Of the 18 playable civilizations, 8 had the ability to choose one of two leaders. It wasn't the male-female split of number 2, but it offered more customization for 
play. Play in France and want to focus on culture? Choose Louis XV. Want Paris, but also want to conquer the world? Hey, there's Napoleon. This feature allowed players to really tailor the experience they wanted. And it was a clever way to incorporate the idea that countries aren't static things, that throughout history their personalities and motifs and the motives change. That's kind of what civilization is all about anyway, right? More changes included the introduction of great people, unique units born to civs of high culture that added bonuses in five distinct categories, the elimination of the punitive corruption system for more general city maintenance and open borders treaties was now required to trespass on other civs territory unless you were at war with them. Also, finally, the government styles were replaced with a more flexible civics branch, which allowed five different subcategories of governing to be customized for greater depth. Civ 4 came out in 2005 for PC and the following year for Mac OS. Civilization 5. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Where are my squares at? Why are they hexagons now? What in the world is happening? Adding two sides to each piece of the game board wasn't the only thing that Civilization V gave us when it was released on PC in 2010. No, the Dream Reavers at Fur Axis had more in mind. First of all, it has to be mentioned, Civilization V is a huge graphical improvement over its predecessors. The map is now animated. Animals move and graze in their tiles. World leaders now speak in their native tongues and are animated during diplomatic scenes. You can zoom in on battles and see them actually playing out. The five years in between the last entry and this were well, well spent. Looking pretty wasn't the only thing Civ 5 did though. Another huge step was the introduction of city-states. City-states are political entities consisting only of one city and operating mostly independently of the major world players in each game. And they really changed the political landscape in Civilization V, especially when it came to voting for UN resolutions. City-states would vote in favor of a civ they were allied to, meaning that if you befriended a lot and kept their friendship, you could really stack the deck in your favor. Alternatively, if you totally ignored the city states and someone else built the UN, well, mm -mm, good luck. In addition to greatly influencing the United Nations, city states offered a variety of quests that the player could participate in during the game, build the pyramids, donate a certain amount of gold, things like that, which could curry favor with them, offering all sorts of bonuses and even the occasional gifted unit. Thanks for the tanks, Dublin. Erin go wrong. Civilization V also introduced natural wonders, iconic landmarks and increased happiness for the first culture to stumble across them on the map. Civics from the previous game were replaced by social policies, which consisted of 10 separate governing trees that were earned through accumulating cultural points. Each tree awarded buffs based on how you wanted to play, militaristic paths, scientific ones, all kinds. 18 civilizations were released with the base Civilization V game, all with their own unique units, and most with unique abilities and buildings as well. Curiously, and this is only worth mentioning because it's gonna come back, religion was totally absent from the game until the Gods and Kings expansion in 2012. I told myself I wasn't gonna talk about expansions generally, but I find it odd because religion played such a huge role in Civilization VI. Hail to the reigning monarch, the newest game in the series, Civilization VI, came out in 2016, and you better bet I've already logged in more hours in it than I'd care to mention, but a lot has changed. First of all, once again, the graphics are reworked. Not only is the new game super gorgeous, it's also for the first time become quite stylized. Unexplored areas of the map now appear as well, a map. Scrolling to the edge gives you cool compasses and illustrations of sea monsters. It's a cool touch. The game is far more colorful than its predecessors, and for the first time, it's even cartoonish in its art direction. The art style is more flattering to some of the 19 leaders than others. I'll just leave it at that. As I mentioned before, religion is back and it plays a huge role now. In fact, religious victories have replaced a long-standing diplomatic victory route. To achieve it, 50% of the cities in every civilization must be converted. Go forth and spread the word of the leaderboard, my apostles. But seriously, religion has become a more complex and a lot more organic to the whole experience. It's basically a fourth war you wage, in addition to the scientific race, the jockeying for cultural dominance, and uh, uh, real wars, you know. Another huge change is the addition of districts. District areas of your cities that take up their own tile and add all sorts of new options for customization. Wonders will also now take up a tile of their own. 
beating to space becoming much more of a premium for your sieve. Gone are the days of crowding all of your cities together. They now expand much more organically depending on exactly what the player needs them for. It's a much welcome change as is the reworking of the Civics gameplay, now researched separately like scientific discoveries. I love this game, which is funny because it's actually the lowest scoring main civilization game on Metacritic. How low is its atrocious score? Does it blemish the series? 88%? Not bad, said Meyer. Not bad at all. As you can see, diplomacy may have become more complex, gameplay may have been streamlined, and technology may have marched forward, but Sid Meier and his team have built a game series to stand the test of time. And they don't show signs of slowing down anytime soon. Once again, I'm Darren P. Mack with the leaderboard, and thanks for watching Civilization Then vs. Now. Who do you play as? Did we miss anything? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. And if you'd like getting more out of your game, subscribe to the leaderboard, your home for video game facts.